I'm the associate director at Kings County Hospital. I've been there for 22 years. Um, we're located in East Flatbush, Brooklyn. This is the place where I work. Um, I have to say that, as a disclosure, I don't get any money from Taser for lecturing or any of the other products I lecture about. Um, if you know anybody that wants to have lecturers and pay them, I'm happy to do it. I'm a county doc, I don't make that much money. So we're gonna go over some facts and stats about tasers, how many people get tased here and there. We'll talk about the device and how it works. And then we're gonna talk about the injury patterns that tasers create. And then finally, we'll talk about dart removal. So in 1969, NASA started on this concept of tasers. And they called it a taser uh, after the science fiction writer, Tom Swift's electrical rifle. That's what taser is made on, or founded on, right? And Tom Swift is his character in a book. He'd shoot people with his rifle, and they would just fall on the ground, paralyzed, and couldn't move, but he wouldn't injure them. Great concept, right? You don't want to injure somebody. You just want to subdue them. Originally, tasers were made with gunpowder behind them to fire the darts out. But the problem with this is that's a firearm, and it's very hard to sell to people because you need a license. You need to be, it's regulated. So Taser is a smart company. Taser wants to market to as many people as possible. So what Taser did is instead of using gunpowder, they switched to using nitrogen. You know when you open up a Guinness can, it's got that nitrogen ball on the bottom? Tasers are powered by something like that. Right? It's a nitrogen capsule that fires and darts out very, very quickly. But it's no longer a firearm. It's not categorized as that. And now you can market to anybody in the public. You can sell to anybody. Drastically increase their numbers, increase their sales. Most tasers, especially the pistols, will come out with a wire attached to them. And it's between 15 and 35 feet of wire, depending on which model you buy. All police units are all the 15 foot units. So police officers have to be relatively close to people to use their tasers. They don't get the big long ones, except in one case we'll talk about later. When tasers came out, you guys all know that police officers are allowed to use lethal force and non-lethal force, and that's it. When tasers came out, there was this worry that they would electrocute your heart and kill you, so they wouldn't give them the non-lethal force designation. So they actually called them less lethal. This really pissed Taser off because they can't market it as well. When they say we're totally safe, nobody believes it because they weren't given the non-lethal designation. They were called less lethal. Taser then put a ton of money into research trying to prove that they were safe. Uh, we'll look at the literature a little bit later, but there's over 300 papers written about tasers and taser injuries. <coughs> so let's look. When the police officer wants to take down somebody who's acting irrational, what can they do? Well, they can shoot you. Look at a thousand firearm discharges, okay? If a person, a thousand people are shot, as long as you hit them, which we're only going to look at people who got hit, half of them will be killed. Half of them will have injuries. But it's 100% of the people who get shot will have something wrong with them. If you hit them with a <coughs> baton, 780 or 78% of them will have an injury. That's a pretty big number, all right, depending on what you hit. Is it skull? Is it jaw? Is it ribs? Right? These are all important things that you'd like to keep intact and not have broken. That's a lot of injuries from batons. Same number, 78% for being punched. A little bit lower, only 45% for being kicked. All right, maybe cops can't get their leg up high enough. They're not quite limber enough. All they can do is kick you in the leg, it doesn't do much damage. But if you're tased, only two people in a thousand were the sustained an injury. That's a really good number compared to all the other numbers out there. So this is what Taser markets their product on. It's less lethal, it's less dangerous. So this is directly off the Taser website, all right? 3.5 million units deployed in the last whatever years. 99.75% no injury. When used appropriately, you have to put that qualifier on there. I've seen a couple bad Taser cases where they were not used appropriately. We'll talk about that later. According to the Taser website, 192,000 lives saved. If you don't own a Taser and a guy is coming at you with a hammer, what are you gonna do? Police officer is just gonna shoot him. I now invent a taser and give him the taser, now they can stop him with non-lethal force. So 192,000 lives saved according to taser. This also takes into account that cops' lives who were saved because they tased somebody and the guy didn't get to shoot them. This is all their documents off their website. It's projected, it's their company promoting their company. I'm sure the number is around there someplace, maybe not quite as high, but the number is definitely a positive number. 
Who needs to be tased? We see all these patients who are on different drugs, PCP, ketamine, uh, other stimulants. When they get on these drugs, they don't understand what's going on around them, and they think everybody is out to get them, and they become enraged, right? Everybody's trying to get me, and I don't want anybody touching me because the drug is making me feel too touchy, so they fight back. Normally when you fight, if you overextend your muscles and you start to tear them, it causes pain, and it makes you say, oh shit, don't do that, that really hurts, and your muscle lets up. And a person who's on ketamine especially, or PCP, which they're derivatives of each other, that has a lot of analgesic properties to it. It makes you not feel pain. So when you're pulling on something and your muscle's being stretched, it actually doesn't hurt you. And this is why these people appear so strong, because they have no pain when their muscle's being overstretched and they can exert even more force. That's why crazy people appear stronger than they really are. All right, I saw a guy the other day, we tied him down to the bed, a big ER stretcher, and he stood up and was walking with a stretcher on his back. I have no idea how he did it. Those things are heavy. I've got my foot run over by them and broken toes. Like, those things are heavy. Anybody who's a risk to a police officer or EMS officers really should be tased. I don't want the people protecting me, protecting the citizens, to be injured. Plus, if you're injured, you can't do your job and you can't function in the place you were supposed to be. If they're a risk to themselves, they should be tased. I've seen a lot of cases where people are confused, running around in circles, and start to run out into oncoming traffic. You tase the guy, he drops to the floor, and you avoid him getting hit by a car. Good use of a taser. And then anybody where you're gonna use non-lethal force. If a person's coming at you with a gun, you really shouldn't be tasing them because chances are you risk getting self-injured. Right? Those guys deserve something else. So who shouldn't be tased? Well, children shouldn't be tased. There's a good study out there that I'll bring up later that shows the size of your body matters on how much injury you get. Smaller the body, the more electric per body area, the more chance of having an injury. People who are obviously pregnant, you shouldn't tase. Right? It's never been studied. Nobody's gonna, nobody's gonna fund that study. Like, let's tase pregnant women. <laughs> While I think that a lot of them act irrational, it is not a reason to tase them, and it's never been studied. You're not allowed to tase them. If they are visibly pregnant. All right? You can't always tell. If somebody's got a pregnancy that's a couple weeks old, you can't tell by looking at them. Even if you see that glow, you still can't tell. <laughs> Elderly people, very breakable, have a lot of cardiac active drugs on board, maybe pacemakers. You shouldn't taste older, older people as well. People are at risk to fall, you shouldn't taste. If you guys have ever seen people get tased, their body just stiffens up and they fall to the ground. If they're gonna fall someplace where it's dangerous, then you shouldn't tase them. We had a case a couple years back, maybe five years back, of an EDP, a crazy person, who was on top of a storefront. He was on their awning, and he wouldn't come down. So the lieutenant's like, just tase him, take him down. They tased the guy, and he kind of fell over, and landed skull to street, smashed his skull, and died. All right, that lieutenant was in a lot of trouble for ordering the tasing. All right, you gotta make sure they're gonna be safe when you take them down. If you guys ever watch the videos online of officers getting tased, I don't know if it's a law here, but I know a lot of places do it. If you're gonna carry a taser, you have to be tased once. So you know what it's like. I watch the videos and these guys just stiffen up and fall to the side, but people catch them. If you have nobody to catch you when you fall over, you really risk getting injured by the street. If you can't defend yourself against the street, you risk being injured. People are at risk to self, like this guy. You shouldn't tase this guy, right? You're gonna tase him, all his muscles are gonna tighten up, He's gonna pull the trigger and blow his brains out. This guy should not be tased, right? You gotta talk this guy down and get the gun out of his hand before you tase him, then you can tase him. People who are a lethal risk to PD and EMS, if they're carrying a gun and aiming it at you, that guy shouldn't be tased. Unfortunately, that person has to be shot because they're a risk to my officers and my EMS people. So how does it work? Tasers are conducted electrical weapons, they're also called electroshock weapons, but what they do is they put two darts in you and they send 50,000 volts down the wires. Anything between the wires gets electrified, all right? There's muscle in there, there's nerves in there, but the electricity goes from one dart to the other, it goes across, and it charges anything in there. Electricity, when it goes through your body, likes to find the path of least resistance. The things that conduct electricity well are muscle, because that's how it works, nerves, that's how they work, 
Stuff like bone and skin don't conduct very well. So the electricity is going to go right around that stuff and look for the muscle, look for the nerve. What happens when electricity goes across your muscle? It causes it to contract. And this is how it works. It stiffens you up, pulls all your muscles contracting, and won't let you fight, won't let you move. Additionally, it hits the motor nerves. So even muscles that are not between the two darts, it lights off all the nerves it touches, and it gets distal muscles too. It makes all those muscles contract. And then it hits the sensory nerves. Your sensory nerves rel relay pain back to your brain. If I can super excite all these pain receptors in your brain, it's telling you pain, 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 pain. It makes you, st it gets your attention. It makes you stop moving, stop fighting. So that's the third way it works, by causing a significant amount of pain and telling you to stop moving around, pay attention to this thing that's tasing you. Tasers come in two varieties. Um, they come in pistols, which is what we most always see, but they also come in shotguns now, which I actually never knew about until I wrote this lecture. It's kind of cool. We'll talk about them a bit. Um, the pistol has two darts that come out, but it also has these conductive points on the front. That's where you do something called drive stun. We'll talk about that in a second, too. The shotguns, it's only the shell that's the taser. You don't have to have a taser shotgun. Any shotgun will work. The shell comes out, and we'll talk a lot about how they work because it's really, really smart in what they did. So here's your shotgun shell, right? When it comes out of the barrel, there's a ripcord on it. And when it comes out, the ripcord tears, and it activates the shell, and it makes it electrified. Also, these little uh, wings come out and make it spiral and make it fly straight so you have good aim with it. The four darts in the front hit your body and stick in you. They have barbs and they stay there. There are fracture pins that run down the distance of the shell. And when it hits you, the fracture pins snap. And now it separates into two pieces. This wire that's wrapped around the middle extends and drags out. So now you have two feet of wire dangling this second part. You'll see here that there are these pins that are attached and held in place. When those fracture pins break, they let the pins out. And these actually look like the spines of a chala cactus. What they do is they're very fine, very sharp, and when it hangs down, it swings, and if they can penetrate your clothing and touch your body, now you have two points of contact. You have the initial dart, and then the wired piece that's touching you through these chala cactus uh, spines. That gives you your arc, and it goes across you. These things only weigh like half an ounce. They're very, very light. You guys know when you're shot with like bean bags as non-lethal force, they're heavy and they can actually break bones. They knock you down. They're very, very painful. So they actually cause a lot more problems than these taser darts do. These can also go up to 30 meters. Remember before we saw that the, the tasers that the police use only shoot 15 feet. So now I don't have to get as close to a perpetrator when I want to use this taser. The big problem is though, it's a little shell. I can't put a bunch of batteries in there because it won't fly, it's too heavy. It's light, it's only half an ounce. So what they did is they did a lot of research and they looked at how the brain and how muscles and how nerves conduct and what the patterns look like. And they programmed the taser shotgun shell to be exactly the same as the nerve frequency. So what happens is when you get shot with this, it's not that much current, but it looks exactly the same as what your nerves would say and it makes you tense up and it causes pain. Exactly as if it was the nerve telling you it, they mimic the nerves. Kind of smart. When this thing hits you, it breaks apart. If it hangs down and doesn't hit you the second part, you only have one piece conducting, so you can't tase them yet. So what Taser did is they were smart. They made it electrify the four pins that are in you, and a little bit of current jumped across them. And that's kind of annoying to be electrocuted in a little spot. So when you get electrocuted there, you look down and be like, oh, that's annoying. You go to grab it and pull it out, and now you've created your second point of contact. And now you have an arc between your hand and the dart wherever it is. But they did it by electrifying the pins and making it annoy you. So it's not that it hurts, it's just annoying. Only 500 volts. The big problem is that these are 160 bucks a piece, as opposed to the little taser darts, which are like 10, 20 bucks a piece that inserts into the pistol. So they're very, very much more expensive. But from a business point of view, Pretty good marketing by Taser. I give you a gun that can shoot long distances and are way more expensive, and you miss a lot because it's far away. Sounds perfect to me. <laughs> from the business model, not from the police model. So Taser darts, there are different darts that you can use, and it's actually usually weather dependent. If you work in Miami and Florida where people wear t-shirts or no shirt at all, you can use these little darts that just enter the skin 
and deliver their electricity. You don't want to use big, huge, long darts all the time because if they hit something important, they're going to pierce it and cause injury. You don't want to do that. You want to cause non-injury and just electrocute them and stop them from moving as opposed to really, really injuring them. You want to hurt them but not injure them. If you work in Brooklyn now and it's cold as, cold as hell outside, I want to use these big long darts because everybody's wearing those big puffy coats. You need dart to penetrate those coats. So it's all weather dependent on which dart you use. The wires are all the same, they're all the half the width of a dime. They fly through the air actually pretty nicely. Um, we see uh, all over the place, the patients come in like wrapped up in it because they just take the patient, throw them in the gym bag and bring them in. But we see quite a bit of that. Um, you just have to be careful that dart doesn't hit anything important. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit later. I told you guys before that the tasers have the darts that come out, but if you miss or if you need to do it from the front of the gun, you can do something called drive stun mode. There are two electrodes on the gun, and if you push it against their skin, they get zapped by it. The problem is that the darts or the, the contacts are not that wide apart, and this doesn't cause very much muscle contraction. It only causes pain. So this is a pain compliance device. They're not fired at you. You're touching them with the gun. The big problem with the pain compliance device is, for one, they did a study that found that it pisses people off much more than actually tasting them. So you have a person who's crazy and angry and fighting, now you drive stun them, you piss them off, now they fight three times as hard, and it caused the rage to get even worse in a lot of people. So most EMS battalions and police say you really should not be using drive stun unless it's a last resort. Unless you fire your darts, they're still coming at you, and they're right there in front of you, you can't get away from them. You really shouldn't be using it, it's not very effective. It just pisses them off more. The other thing too is remember we talked about ketamine and PCP before, these drugs are analgesics. They make you feel no pain. If I'm using a pain compliance device, but they have a drug that makes them feel no pain, you can see how it'll be very ineffective to do that. Taser models, the X26 is what most police officers use, most SWAT teams use. They did make the X2 Defender. Remember, Taser's a money-making company. They want to market it to as many people as, co as possible. So they made the X2. It's called the X2 because it has two sets of darts in it. In case you missed the first set, it has another set right below it. So you can shoot it twice now with one load. Makes it a little bit easier. Um, police train with these. They, on a regular basis, go down to the range and take firing practice with the taser. <coughs> Most people in the public are not gonna do that. They're not gonna waste their money buying extra darts. So that one time they need it, it's been sitting in their pocketbook for 18 years, they're not gonna have good aim. They're not gonna be good at it. They're stressed. They're not like able to deal with these situations. So they often miss. So by marketing them and saying, you have a second shot, a second chance, they're willing to buy a lot more tasers because they have a second chance with it. Um, there is a C2 out there, which is a new taser. Remember, tasers are a money-making company. They want to market it to people. So the C stands for color. What they did is they made it in different patterns, trying to appeal to the younger population, females who feel more threatened. They made nice leopard print. Who doesn't want to carry a leopard print taser in their pocket? <laughs> And then the Hello Kitty pink, I love one. So I didn't know this, but one of the guys in my class yesterday told me that if you fire one of these tasers, taser will replace it for free. Because they want people to buy it, they want them to tase them and run away. And they want them to have the confidence that they're not gonna waste their money, they're gonna get another gun back. And they're gonna tell the friends how great a company taser is, they let me get another gun for free, and then they're gonna buy one. So this is great marketing by them, trying to find different markets to send it to. Taser has not been static. They're making a lot of advances in the field. Um, the first one they did is they put a high def camera in all their guns. Now when you taste somebody, as soon as you flip the safety off and you activate the gun, <coughs> the camera turns on and it's audio and picture. You can always see what happened when somebody gets tased in high def living color. They actually put in dual lasers, which I think is kind of cool. It used to be when you put a laser dot on somebody, you're going to see one dot in the middle where the two darts would hit. But the darts spread as they fly. So depending on how far away they are will, tell, will depend on how far apart they hit. And they may just go right around the body, you may miss them totally. By putting two lasers in and angling them where the darts are gonna go, you'll know exactly where the two darts will hit. And if you see one dot's off and one dot's on, you could turn the gun sideways or move closer, but you have a better chance of hitting them if you're using two lasers for alignment. They did put this warning arc on it, so when you half pull the trigger back, it forms a big flash. It's supposed to be helpful. It's supposed to be scary. 
The study that I'm going to show you a little bit shows it doesn't really work, but they're marketing. They want to make it look fancy. They say, people will see this and they'll stop coming at you. I probably would. You're probably right. But not everybody that attacks you is in their right mind. They have rhythm monitors in all tasers now. If you're in the ER, you come in with a heart problem, I put two stickers on your skin and I can monitor your heart. It's even better if I could put two barbed darts in my patients and let them not pull those stickers off. <laughs> I can monitor the heart really, really, really nicely. My boss won't let me put darts in there though, but I want to. But now I can monitor the rhythm and the gun records everything that happens to your patient. Additionally, if you have data in the gun, you have to be able to get it down, so they put a USB download port in the back of the gun. So every taser that's fired, it records what's happened to the patient's heart, and you can download it and analyze it. And then finally, these guys in North Dakota were brilliant. They put a taser on a drone. They don't have to go near the perpetrator anymore. They just fly the drone up to him, zap him, and everybody jumps on him. <laughs> brilliant. So this study, taser is supposed to be used as a staged weapon. Depending on what stage you're on, it'll be effective or not. So these guys looked at 1944 patients, all right? When the taser was pulled out, 33%, one third of the patients said, oh shit, I don't wanna be tased, I give up. Those are probably the sane ones who are not on drugs, who are just acting like a jerk and knew what they were doing. Once the gun was arced, only 1% more people stopped. And it kinda makes sense. If you are in the right state of mind, you know what you're doing, you're thinking, and somebody says, stop moving, I'm going to tase you, you're probably going to stop. Arcing the gun is not going to affect if you're crazy, if you're on drugs, if you don't know what's going on around you. <coughs> they're not going to comprehend what that blue flashy light is. They may stare at it because it looks cool, but they're not going to comprehend what it is. Once the gun was aimed at you, another 9% said, ooh, shit, I don't want to get tased. So they stopped moving and they complied. Whoops. 45% of people, the next 45%, when the red dot was put on their chest, that really got their attention. So almost half the people stopped fighting and became compliant with just being red dotted. That's actually pretty good numbers. And then finally, the last number, 11% had to be tased. Think about that. I can stop 89% of people with a taser without actually electrocuting them. That's a great number. That's actually an effective weapon that has no danger 89% of the time. I do want to point out here that how they're low, that aiming, aiming at the guy's belly. That's how you're taught to aim. Because what you don't want is you don't want an arc of electricity going across somebody's heart. It puts that at higher risk of developing a problem. So everybody who uses tasers is taught, shoot at the midsection. This is really interesting. When these tasers were given to the cops in Austin, 30% less injuries to their people they took down. Florida, 50%. Houston, 60%. Seattle, 48%. Wake Forest, 99.75% drop in injuries to the people being arrested. What the fuck were these guys doing before they had tasers? They were like beating the crap out of people. They gave them a taser and they realized, oh, we really don't have to really hurt them. Other stats, 76% less injuries to law enforcement. That's a great number for you guys. That's two thirds of your injuries or more are not happening anymore because you can use the taser. And then workers' comp, down 93%, right? If you're an officer, you take somebody down, he grabs your finger, bends it back, kicks you in the knee, you can't walk. These guys go out in workers' comp. They get paid and they don't have to work, and they're injured. That's terrible. 93% drop in workers' comp cases. Why should you use a taser and not another means of non-lethal force? Well, you use it to target strength. If you're an old person, you're pretty frail, you have weak muscles, you have weak bones. To move your bones, you use your own muscles. It's not that much force because you're older. If I have a big, huge, 230 pound diesel ESU cop jumping on top of you as a little old man, it's really easy to break stuff. It's really easy to put their arm behind them and snap their whole shoulder off, right? You don't want to do that to these poor little old people. Tasers only use the strength that's in the body already. All they do is light off your muscle nerves, light off your muscles, and make your muscles work against you. Additionally, they don't usually send one ESU cop at you, they send four. All four of these 240 pound guys, 260 guys, landing on top of you, you break ribs, you break things inside your belly. It's really dangerous to be taken down to the ground by all this weight. And then finally, you don't get hit, right? When you get tased, it hurts a lot for five seconds. It's incredibly painful from what I hear. 
Has anybody there ever been tased? You guys do it? How painful was it? It's the most incredible pain you'll ever get. So as as you That's from a man who has not born a child. <laughs> it's really painful. I mean, it's incredibly painful. So, so it shuts off its tongue. Exactly. And that's why I personally believe in tasers. I think a bad pain for five seconds is better than being hit with a lead-filled billy club and having this bruise for two weeks. That's my belief. Not everybody believes that. We'll see that in a second, too. But less chance for injuries. Some of the negatives about tasers. Some of these cops, when you give them a taser, normally they would talk to you, talk you down, reason with you, be nice to you. All right? But some of these cops develop what we call lazy cop syndrome. Guy standing there with a hammer. Cop says, put your weapon down. Guy says, go fuck yourself. Says, put your weapon down. Tells him to go screw off again. And he tases them. If he didn't have a taser, he would argue with the guy. He would fight with him. He would reason with him. He'd take 15 minutes to get him to sit down. Put a taser on his side. I told you twice. Now you're tased. So they become lazy and they don't actually use their... Um, brains to try and defuse the situation. They just tase you because it's easier. <laughs> In some places, it's considered inhumane and it's outlawed because of how much pain it causes. Luckily for us, it's not here. Um, like I said, I believe in them. I think they work. But in some places, they think it's so painful that it's not fair and you shouldn't be using them. I got to say that I've been maced before. Uh, a cop maced a patient in the ER while I was working. And I didn't even know about it. I ran in the room because they were seizing. And I grabbed the person, threw him back in the stretcher. And I was like, oh, wow, my whole front burns. And I can't breathe. What's going on? And the cop's like, oh, I just maced him. I was like, oh, thanks for telling me. That was very, uh, <laughs> very helpful. Need to know. Um, I think it's much, much nicer than beating them or macing them. That stuff lasts, the pain lasts for hours. Getting mace in your eyes, hours and hours and hours of pain. The taser pain may be worse, but it's only five seconds of pain if you pull the trigger once. There are some off-limit targets. If you have a nine-year-old or a pregnant woman coming at you with a hammer, you can't tase them. You have to do something different. They're off-limits. You can't do it. One of the problems is there's no stigmata of being tased, right? I tase somebody because I'm at a party and having fun. I pull the darts out, walk away. Nobody knows what happened. They don't know it's my gun, although there's some proof now we'll talk about in a minute. But nobody knows. Can't tell. Little holes, they heal pretty quickly. Nobody knows. There are some clothings out there that can defeat tasers. Some of the tactical clothing has foil sewn into the lining. Remember that electricity travels down the path of least resistance. If it gets into your blood, that's a good pathway because it's got electrolytes in there and it flows. But if I put it into metal foil, that's even better. So the taser electricity is gonna choose to go through the foil rather than go through your body. So if you're really serious about not being tased, you can buy this clothing with foil inside it that keeps you from being tased. And then again, these people with excited delirium, they're not like thinking about pain, right? They don't care about it. So tasing them as a pain compliance doesn't really work well against people who are not thinking about pain, who don't care about pain, who have a drug on board shielding them from pain. So to point, when you shoot a taser, the darts come out, they stick in you, and it delivers a five second shock, no matter what. You can't change that, it happens. This is something I thought was really cool. They have these aphids. APHIDs are anti-felon ID devices. When a taser is shot, all this confetti comes out the front. And each piece of confetti has a number on it. And you can always tell where the, where the round was bought and what size darts it was and everything about it from the confetti. So these things fly out, they're all over the floor, and it looks like a party until you get tased, but they're all over the floor. So that's how I can tell where they were tased and what, what round was shot at them. If you pull the trigger once, one shot. If you let go and pull it again, because they're not complying still, you can shock them again, and you can shock them again, and again and again, if you want to, and if it's indicated. The problem is they don't always do it when it's indicated. This guy in Texas, Eric, he was shocked 20 times. Ended up going into cardiac arrest and dying from it. So the more shots you deliver, the higher chance you have of having a bad outcome. So keep that in mind when you're using a taser. Additionally, if you hold the trigger and hold it down, you will apply a continuous shock to them. This inmate in South Carolina, he was shocked for two minutes and 49 seconds straight. 
Think about what happens when, for two minutes and 49 seconds, your respiratory muscles don't move. You can't do anything. It is no surprise that guy went to VTAC and died. Two minutes and 49 seconds straight of that pain that's so painful you can't bat imagine. Five seconds, not bad. Two minutes and 49 seconds, that's a tremendous amount of pain to endure. There's also a risk for ignition, which I found totally fascinating when I was writing this lecture. If you shoot, shoot somebody in a gas station, you have a risk of blowing up the whole gas station. Remember that when the taser hits you, it's 50,000 volts. The dart doesn't actually have to be in you, it just has to be close to you. If it's close and the other dart is in, the electricity is gonna arc from the taser to you, and it's gonna look like lightning, that's what arcing is. When it goes across there, if you're in a gas station with gas fumes, it's gonna ignite the flammable substance. Methamphetamine's another one. When they make methamphetamine, they make it with ether. Ether is an incredibly flammable substance. So you go into a meth lab, and their testers are on meth, they're testing out the product, or for fun, and you go to tase them, and then the whole lab blows up, because there's ether every place. Very, very dangerous. Finally, CS spray. CS spray is the uh, propellant they use behind mace. And they did a study where they maced seven mannequins. And then they tased them. Two out of the seven caught fire from the CS spray. Lucky for us, the CS spray is really only used in Great Britain and England. We use a different mace here that doesn't use CS. So it's not the flammable type here. I guess if you're gonna use non-lethal force, you should taser them first and then mace them after when the taser fell. You shouldn't do it in the opposite direction. <laughs> and then the big one is the butane lighters. Picture being hit by a dart fired out of a gun that hits your lighter. The lighter deflects the dart and doesn't let it go into your body, but it's sitting right next to you. It now arcs across from the dart to your body in an environment where there's a broken butane lighter. Butane in your jacket, next to your body, being arced, that's a setup for a burn. Right? That's a setup that you're going to catch fire. So what things inside your body make you more prone to get injured? Because right? this is the ones I see. The guys who get tased, taken down, and have no problems, I never see those guys. I don't care about them. They're just going to go to jail. But the ones that get injured are the ones that I want to deal with and the ones that I want to know about. So what makes you more likely to be injured? People aren't cardiac active drugs. Drugs that propel your heart. If you have a heart failure and a weak heart, we give you drugs to make your heart stronger. Those drugs are also pro-arrhythmogenic, and they make your heart beat irregular if they're stimulated. So I have an arrhythmogenic action on your heart, and now I electrocute your heart. You can see how it's a setup for something bad. Illicit drugs, stimulants, cocaine, methamphetamine, these also stimulate your heart and make it more receptive to electricity, more chance of going to VTAC, VFib. If you have coronary artery disease already, if you're an old person with diabetes, hypertension, you've had three stents put in, had two MIs, if you're fighting with me, you're probably fighting as much as you can, as much as your little heart will let you fight. I now tase you and I excite all your muscles. This is an overstimulation, overwork. It's possible to give them another heart attack from the body requiring more blood than the heart can give it. If you're unable to cool down, a lot of these patients that we see are psych patients. One of the side effects of psych meds is inability to sweat. If you're 106 degrees because you're fighting and now I tase you, I push your temperature up to 107, 107 and a half, because now all your muscles are contracting and creating heat. That's really bad because your proteins start to degenerate. They start to break down once you get above 106, 107. If your proteins don't work, your body doesn't work, and you die. And then, again, these people who are in an excited delirium state, when you tase them, sometimes they go into arrhythmias. You don't have to be tased to go into an arrhythmia in an excited state. I'm sure you guys have seen the Eric Garner case. That guy was only wrestling, and he ended up getting a fatal injury from it. So you don't have to be tased. And the truth is that it's never been proven to be associated. We'll look at that literature in a minute, too. So what are the things that kill you or injure you from tasers? This is what I worry about. Well, you can have cardiac injuries. You can go into VTAC, VFib. That's a non-perfusing rhythm. When your heart goes up to a rate of 260, it doesn't have enough time to pump blood, and you end up dying from it. Also, if the dart hits you right between the ribs and you're using one of the long darts, you can actually pierce the heart, injure the heart. So you want to try and avoid that. <coughs> if you get hit in the chest cavity, it's going to make all those uh, respiratory muscles contract, and now you can't breathe for as long as the trigger's held down. So you actually go into like a breath-holding spell, you can't move your lungs around. 
all your muscles are contracting all at once. That causes problems too. You can actually rip the muscles and let out all the stuff that's inside. And the stuff inside your muscles is actually kind of bad for your body. It causes kidney injury and it causes other problems. And then finally, there are some sensitive structures on your body that you don't want hit with a one inch dart. We'll talk about those individually in a second. And last, if you have a pacer in place, a pacemaker, if you electrify your pacemaker, what happens to it? That's a little bit worrisome. So who dies from being tased? People who go into VTAC, V-Fib, that's a non-perfusing rhythm, they end up dying. Some people also go into a bradycardia, a slow rhythm. They can die as well. They did a study that showed there were two deaths in 1,000 tasers. And they looked at them and they said, out of the 1,000 people tased, 22% of them had darts that were around the heart, delivering electricity to the heart. So why did only two of them die when 22%, 220 of them, had a vector that crossed their heart? Probably because the taser was not causing the death. They were just unlucky for some other reason. We'll talk about that in a second. And then, of course, guys who fall down, that person who fell off the awning and landed on their head, that's a taser death. But an inappropriate use taser death, not an appropriate use taser death. So what does the literature say? When you look back and see all these smart people, what did they publish? By the way, if you look in the literature, there are 300 plus papers on tasers. Every single one of those papers, I could not find a single one that wasn't written by one of the authors that works for taser. There's something about funded research that makes me sort of not believe it. If I'm giving you money to say my product works and you get no money if you don't say the product works, you'll do one of two things. You'll alter the data or you just won't publish it, right? Taser is not gonna let you publish a study that says whenever I put a dart right here and right here, the person dies. That research will never make it to the market. They'll just, they'll just hide it and get rid of it. So I question the literature because it's all written by the same guys. I wanna see literature that's written by an unbiased person who really is honest and tells you what happens. The problem is that nobody wants to study it unless you're gonna pay me for it because they're just not going to. This book is a whole book on taser weapons. It's the Atlas of Conducted Electrical Weapons and Forensic Analysis. This is a whole entire book on taser discharges. The Journal of Forensic and Legal Medicine in 2015, examining sudden deaths of people in custody. This looked at all the people in custody who died over the years. Out of those, 336 people were tased out of all the people in custody who died. Out of those 336 people, 115 or 34% had at least one dart in their chest. So 34% died with a dart in their chest. That means two thirds of the people who died did not have an electrical vector crossing their chest. It leads me to believe that taser probably didn't cause a death, but who knows. Out of those 115 with one dart in their chest, 7% had two darts in their chest. That is definitely a vector that crosses the heart. But that's a small number compared to all those other people who died. So I'm really not sure that tasers are causing the death. I think they probably would have died anyway. Taser may have helped it along a little bit, but it's never been proven to be the cause of death, right? Nobody ever had died of an arrhythmia. They died of a bunch of other things. American Journal of Forensic Medicine Pathology in 2015. Incapacitating devices discharge at risk of bradycardia, risk of slow heart rate, all right? These guys looked at everybody tased on record and they went through the data and almost nobody had bradycardia. If they did, it only lasted for five seconds you were being tased or 10 seconds. It was not clinically important. It had no medical bearing. But there was only one case. And I'm trying to figure out if a taser runs at 19 hertz, that's the amount of electricity it tases you, right? It tases you 19 times in one second. If it runs at 19 hertz, why is your heart slowing down? It should make it faster, if anything. It's a pain device. It should make it faster. So they theorize it's either due to stress, right? Some people, when they get stressed, they pass out because their heart gets slow. Or maybe due to breath holding. If I make you hold your breath for a minute, your heart slows down. And if it slows enough, you can pass out. But out of all these people, only one case of bradycardia, and nobody died from it. Journal of Forensic Legal Medicine in 2016. Intracardiac electrographic assessment of precordial taser shocks. This is a brilliant study, actually. They looked at everybody who got tased, and they said, who has a pacemaker? Who has an internal defibrillator? 
Let's look at your defibrillator and query it. What they do is they put a little probe over your chest that has a magnet, and they talk to the device. And they said, what happened in the last day? Tell me about this guy's heart. And when they looked at it, not a single person had an arrhythmia while being tased. Now granted, it's only four people, but that tells me a lot. That tells me that the heart is not inducible into a fast rhythm because they have somebody standing there watching it. And then of course, no interference with the pacemaker either. Even though they got tased, it didn't short circuit the pacemaker, it didn't turn it on, didn't turn it off, it didn't do any, anything to it. So that's also a very, very meaningful data for, for taser company. Journal of Forensic and Legal Medicine in 2017. <coughs> fatal and non-fatal burn injuries due to tasers. 3.17 million taser deployments, only 10 burns. Uh, six fatal and four non-fatal. Eight out of those 10 people who got burned had a butane lighter in their pocket. Kind of makes sense. I shoot somebody, they have butane in their clothing, and then I electrocute them. That's not a surprise that they blew up and caught fire. Yet another reason you shouldn't smoke. Smoking is dangerous for you. <laughs> so, if you put all the literature together, 3.17 million deploys, deployments, Taser has never been proven once, not one, zero cases of arrhythmia and death due to Taser. However, because they worry about it so much, it was still given that they wouldn't give it the non-lethal name, they gave it a less lethal name even though that's never proven to have a problem. That's a little bit unfair almost, but people, people believe in conspiracy theory, who knows? All right, so what are the causes of cardiac death? How do you die from tasers? Well, if a taser punctures your heart and you bleed out, that's a pretty bad one. So that's why they use the right size dart for the right weather. You'll never see cops using the long darts in the summertime. Unfortunately, in the wintertime, if you're wearing a big coat, but the dart hits you right here in your neck, you risk hitting something pretty important because the dart's gonna penetrate. But for the most part, the patients or the targets are covered and it's usually not gonna cause that much damage. Ischemia we talked about, if you're already fighting as much as you can and your heart has had a heart attack in the past has stents, if I make it go faster, you may overwhelm the heart and give you heart attacks. You could die from a heart attack, obviously. And then arrhythmia, you know, it's never been proven to happen but what Taser did is they took these big supercomputers and they built models. And they said, what would have to happen in order to really give somebody VTAC v fit? And they had the computer generate millions and millions and millions and millions of case scenarios. And they showed during this generation that only one in 2.8 million people would develop VTAC v fib if they were shot with a Taser. That's actually a pretty good number. That makes me feel a little bit comfortable. Again, we saw that one case of bradycardia and it's never, ever been proven to cause a systole. You guys all know when you get struck by lightning, it makes your heart just stop. It makes your breathing stop. But tasers electricity, just like lightning, it's just not as high of a current. And it doesn't cause that asystole just instantly kill you. It just doesn't do it. So when they look at people who are going into VTAC, VFib, they look about why they went into VTAC, VFib. There's a couple reasons you can do it. However, they only showed us a temporal association. It happens with being tased, but it doesn't show it as a cause to being tased. And again, what they did is they ran these models, millions and millions and millions of models on a supercomputer. And they said, how many people would get RNT phenomena? You guys all know that if you get a heartbeat too early and you're in your refractory period, it'll put you into VT. That's called RNT. So how many times do I have to tase somebody to give them the RNT phenomena? They said you have to taste somebody between 1 and 10 seconds, and you have to use a very, very high electrical force to do it, higher than the guns will deliver. So it's probably not going to happen. What about if you could directly induce the heart into VT? Remember, tasers shock you at 19 times a second. What if I can make the heart go fast enough, 19 times a second, to put you into VTAC VFib? You don't have to taste them for about 5 seconds at most, but you need a strong current. But it's possible. But again, not likely. One in like two million to get it done. And then they said, how many times do I have to tase you in order to cause you to have a heart attack from racing your heart? And this actually was a, only took a weak current. But you'd have to hold the taser on for between 90 and 30 seconds in order to make it happen. And that just doesn't happen. Nobody tases you for that long. Unless you're that poor inmate in South Carolina. 
What about weight? How does weight affect you going to VTAC v fit? Well, you can see here, if you're down around 10 or 20 kilos, then you actually have a high chance of going to VTAC v fit. This is why we don't taste children and babies. That is just not right, but <laughs> you just shouldn't be tasting babies. If your weight is over 40 kilos, your chance of VTAC v fib are just about zero. If you look at the weight of all the people who are tased, because I write it down, when you get booked into prison, the average weight of everybody tased was 90 kilos. That is so far away from the higher threshold of what VTAC v fib is uh, induced by, it's just not going to happen. So let's look at some of the sensitive structures you can get struck in. This guy was taken through a hospital who shot in the eye with a taser dart. Unfortunately, your eyes are soft and mushy. They're very sensitive structures. They are a lot of specialized. They do a lot of things. If you're shot in the eye with a taser dart, you're probably going to lose your eye. I saw a guy actually a couple weeks ago who the dart actually went through his eye and stuck into the skull behind his eye. And the only thing sticking out was the wire. The whole dart was gone inside his eye. He did lose his eye. If you get struck in the dart, if you get struck in the eye with a dart, you're probably going to lose your eye. But luckily, they always teach you to aim low at the belly, and it usually, nothing's 100%, but usually won't happen. Unfortunately, if you're fighting and moving around, it's hard to tell what the dart's going to hit. You can get struck in the eye. While you lose your vision, they can make you look nice and pretty again. Here's a nice case of a prosthetic eye that was put in. They just <coughs> sewed, sewed over the orbit and put a nice prosthetic in there. It's actually really even hard to tell if they don't have an eye the positive side of being struck in the eye. What happens if being struck right in the middle of your forehead? The way your skull is constructed, it's a box, and it's a very solid box. But the front of it has a window. It's called the frontal sinus. And it's got an airspace between two plates of bone. If you get stuck in the outside with a taser dart, it can break the bone and collapse it in. So if you're unlucky enough to be hit right in the middle of the head, at close range where the darts are moving fast, you can actually collapse it in their frontal sinus. Here's what looks like a CAT scan. You can see that the frontal sinus should be filled with air. Here it's filled with blood. And the plate out here is pushed backwards and in. The good thing is, if your frontal sinus, the outer plate is broken, it's actually not that big a deal. It doesn't cause that much problem. The problem is when both plates are broken, the internal and the external plate. Because now you have a pathway from the skin through your skull into your brain. Anything on the outside can get to the inside. You can end up with meningitis, you can end up with a lot of infections. Here's a nice CT recon. Um, this guy was shot in the head by like a projectile that was like bigger than a BB. It was probably a pellet, uh, but it wasn't a bullet. Hit the frontal sinus and just collapsed the frontal sinus in. But you can see here, whole thing collapsed in. So I put this picture in just for your entertainment. My ex-wife was an oral surgeon, so I used to see a lot of the cases she did. It was kind of cool. So to fix the frontal sinus, which is here in the front of your head, you don't want to cut the face. You don't want to mess it up. So what they do is they cut around the back of your head from ear to ear. And then they take your scalp and they roll it and they unroll it off your skull. And they expose your whole entire skull. They take a metal fence and they drill holes into the periphery and put screws into your skull and mount the fence to your skull. Now all the bone chips that are inside, they put a screw through the fence and they turn on the drill and it pulls the bone chips, the fragments, back to the fence. And it recreates the sinus very, very nicely in a nice flat plate. Then they take your hair, they roll it back on into place, or your scalp if you have no hair, they roll it back into place, and they sew it around the back, and now you only have a scar in the back of your head, not the front of your head. It's a very elegant surgery, very brilliantly constructed, least amount of deformity to the person. All right, we talked about all your muscles contracting at once. That's a lot of force to fight against. Your spine is created with discs and bones. The bones are very solid, very hard to break. But your discs are this nice squishy material um, in the disc in the middle. The disc is made of two pieces. The middle is the squishy part. That's called the nucleus propulsus. And the outer part is a fibrous ring, a fibrous donut that houses the squishy part and keeps it in place. That's called the annulus fibrosis. When your body absorbs a shock, it lands on that squishy part, bounces, and absorbs the shock. But if I now give you a huge amount of force and squeeze every muscle in your back 
and make them squeeze together, the annulus fibrosus can actually burst. And the nucleus propulsus can squeeze out through that hole. If it comes out in the front of your body, any place anterior, it's no big deal. It's just going to stick out. You lose a little bit of your bounce, but it'll just stick out. The big problem is when it comes out backwards, where your nerves are. It comes out backwards, pokes out, and pushes on the nerve. This is extremely, extremely painful. It causes radicular pain. It causes sciatica. It's really, really, really painful. If you're lucky, you'll burst forwards and not backwards, but all that force created by the taser can actually squeeze your discs and burst your discs. Fixing it, luckily, is pretty easy. Um, they used to do this big back surgery where they opened you up and took all the muscles apart. They don't do that anymore. They put a scope in with a laser, and they just cut off that piece of disc that's sticking out and pull it out. It's kind of easy to do. Um, it's still very painful and it's still a big deal, but it's a lot easier than what they used to do. And then finally, being shot in the testicles is never fun. Um, it's a pretty sensitive area of your body. They tell you to aim low, so there's a chance it's going to happen. This is kind of how I envision it feels if I've never been tased in testicles. Here's a guy who was tased, and the, the dart didn't really make it into the testicle very well, so it arced, and it caused a burn on the bottom of the scrotum. Additionally, because the skin was violated, it led to an infection and then an abscess. So this guy has a burn, cellulitis, and an abscess on the bottom of his testicles. All because he wouldn't listen. Not a great case. This guy's not having a good day. This one was shot at close range, and the dart actually ruptured his testicle. It just shattered it and blew it apart. Can't do too much about that. Cut it off, and you put a prosthesis in there. Actually, interesting enough, my housemate in medical school had testicular cancer when he was young, and he had it removed. And he had a little uh, prosthesis put in there. So we used to call him Spalding because it was kind of like a racquetball. <laughs> so my housemate Andrew was a little bit crazy. He would get drunk at parties, and what he'd do is he'd go up to the table, he'd pull out his scrotum, and he'd put it on the table. And then he'd smack it. And everybody's like, wow, he has the highest pain thrower special that anybody I've ever seen. But he was just smacking the racquetball. It was no big deal. He's just totally crazy. He's an OBGYN now, too, which I think is <laughs> totally, totally inappropriate. All right, can you get infections from being tased? They actually went to the taser company and they swabbed all the darts they could find. And they found that 5% of them, only 5%, had staph aureus on the dart. That's a pretty good number. However, they did some studies and they said that darts, when they hit you, have 1,200 volts per millimeter, and those sterilize the darts when they're in you. What do they call that? Electroportation. They used to sterilize the dart. So they shouldn't cause infections because they don't. But I saw this guy just a couple years ago, he got tased on the side, and he has a big cellulitis. His whole entire side is infected, the skin is infected. So while it shouldn't infect you, it still does. So cellulitis is a risk. So when you take the darts out, you should probably give them antibiotics. When your muscles are all contracting, they're working super hard, especially if you're on a drug that doesn't make you feel pain, they can get overworked and your muscles can burst. When your muscles burst, they re release something called CK. That's an enzyme that's in your muscles that make your muscles work. But the problem with CK is it's dangerous to the rest of your body, especially your kidneys. If you get a lot of CK running around in your blood system, they can poison your kidneys and shut down your kidneys. So it's possible that you can go into kidney failure from being tased. When CK gets high, we call that myelo, uh, myelolysis. So your chances of having uh, a legitimate kidney injury from being tased once for five seconds is very small. Don't get me wrong, your CK number will go up, but it's not clinically significant. You really have to get to about eight or 10,000 level of CK before you have any worry. Your CK goes up to 200, 300, it's not a big deal. And that's usually what you see when people get tased. If you get shot multiple times, multiple trigger pulls, multiple electrocutions, you obviously have a higher chance of going into rhabdo, right? Because I've electrocuted you multiple times, I'm destroying cells multiple times, it happens. If the darts hit you very far apart, there's a lot more muscle in that arc that can get pulled. So you have a higher chance of having a muscle injury with a bigger arc path. 
And then realize that people who are on drugs, people who are fighting, people who are hyperthermic, who are warm, <coughs> these guys get myelolysis no matter what, whether you get tased or not. So maybe it's not due to the taser. Maybe it's due to just the situation that you're in. Granted, the taser is really not helping it at all, quite the opposite, but the chance of you getting rhabdo is up there even without being tased. Lactic acidosis happens when your body is fighting and using up all the oxygen. If your muscles get no oxygen, they switch to a form of energy creation that doesn't use oxygen, and that creates lactic acid. We see a lot of really sick patients with a high lactic acidosis, but nobody's ever proven that the lactic acid is the problem. It's really just a marker of some underlying problem. So while the lactic acidosis doesn't hurt you, it's there and you should worry about it. You should know, excuse me, you should know that there's a problem going on and you should investigate what's going on. Well, what does lactic acidosis look like? Well, you get headaches, sleepiness, confusion, muscular seizure activity, diarrhea, respiration problems, arrhythmias, nausea, vomiting. This is what the patients look like anyway if they come in after being inside delirium. So who knows if it's the lactic acid that's causing the problems or they have the problems and it's just a marker. Let's talk about dart removal. So if you look at the OSHA guidelines, OSHA tells you how to do everything in medicine to make it safe for the practitioner. OSHA does not have any guidelines at all for taser dart removal, none. So you're kind of up to your own guesswork as to what you should do. There's no manual written on it. Of course, Taser does sell a product, surprisingly enough, for a cost that you can use to take darts out with. It's very nice of them to provide that. Me personally, I just numb you up, twist it, and pull it out. But here's the Taser device. It comes in a nice pretty box. It's color-coded, very fancy, justifies the $300 cost maybe. It's a gun that has a front that comes off and be, can be put on. And the gun has cylinders on the front that you put over the darts. Here it is being put together. It's two pieces. What you do is you put the gun over the dart and push until it clicks. Now the dart is locked into the channel and you're supposed to just pull it out. It's supposed to work without twisting, without doing anything else. You know, it says you don't have to numb them up. I find that inhumane. Even if you were tased, even if you're a bad person, I still think you deserve good medical care. So you really should be numbed up before the darts are pulled out. Once the darts are put into the gun, you take this little slide right here and you pull it backwards. And that locks the dart in place so it's stuck inside the gun. You do the other dart, put a nice red metal covering on it, pull it off the gun, hand it to law enforcement so they can put it into evidence. That's what you're supposed to do. Here's one that I saw just a couple days ago. This guy was tased with a short dart. It was not that cold out at the time, took some lidocaine and it made a big fat wheel of lidocaine all around the dart. So the whole skin is numb. Twist it quite a few times, because remember the darts have a barb on them. If you twist them, you just break up the tissue the dart is in, and then it's pulled, and they come right out. And then you have a choice. You can hand it to law enforcement, you could throw it in the sharps container, or I put it in my bulletin board using the thumbtacks. <laughs> So let's review. The taser is a conductor electrical weapon. It comes in either a pistol or a shotgun form. It excites your sensory neurons that cause pain and your motor neurons that cause muscle contraction and your muscles. <clears throat> Usually used on people in an agitated state but realize they don't feel pain very much. Arrhythmias due to tasers are exceedingly rare and don't really happen. It's never been proven. There's a temporal association but it's never been proven to cause it. Think about your vulnerable body parts. Frontal sinus, eyes, chest and heart, testicles. Always think about testicles. And then take them out, numb and twist and pull, and give them back to law enforcement. Has there any questions? Um, with the actual shotgun, so the um, <coughs> taser itself, as long as you hold down the trigger, is as long as it's going to tase you. How does the shotgun work as far as that goes? So it has that ripcord, and as soon as it comes out of the gun, it activates the dart. It lasts for 10 seconds, and it electrocutes for 10 seconds. You don't get an extra shot on it. It's just that one time burst. Again, shoot them once, and you can't get close enough to get them down. You gotta shoot them again. That's another $180 dart yeah. that you gotta use. So you have to use more darts. But it only has that one, one time, one time usage. So that's a good question. I didn't cover that.
PMS if you just to be hyper paranoid about the uh, like medication patches like nitro with the AD? Has there been a single documented case of? Nope, no. nothing at all. But again, drugs that sensitize your heart to arrhythmias, you got to think about it. All right, nitroglycerin is not the nitroglycerin from explosives. Like nitroglycerin, if I drop a bottle on the floor, it doesn't blow up. I've done that a lot of times actually. Um, it does doesn't blow up. It's different nitroglycerin. No, that's oh, fine. just stretching. Anybody else? Um, how does this affect somebody with a neuropathy type uh, impairment? It's an excellent question. I've never seen anything directly on it, so I'm going to tell you from my knowledge of medicine and theory. I think if your nerves are already hyperexcited and causing you pain, and you electrocute them, you're probably going to feel more pain than a person who would not have neuropathy. If your neuropathy is numbness and you don't feel anything, I'm not sure. Maybe it won't work against you. If you're shot in the foot where your neuropathy is, most neuropathies are in the feet, most. Um, if you're shot in the foot, you probably won't feel it, I'm guessing, but I don't know the answer to that. It's a good question. I'll try and look into it and try and see what I can find on it, but I don't know the answer. Do you think there's any indications or uh, use cases for where uh, a patient who's been tased doesn't need to be transported to the ED, or do you think pretty much everyone, most EMS systems and the CAT protocols to transport to the ED? I think they all should be transported for a couple reasons. For one, you want to monitor the rhythm, make sure they don't have an arrhythmia. For two, the darts got to come out. Although a lot of people yesterday told me that the EMS guys take them out themselves and they don't bring them to the ER for dart removal, just for monitoring. Our cops take them out. We take them out. Yeah, and in my institution, we take them out. Cops won't touch them. Uh, but I guess it depends on where you are. Where are you from? Hamburg, I'm from Baltimore. So we tase, we remove the darts, and then we get medicine going out. And they don't go. Really, they don't go? I mean, it's supposed to be non-lethal. It's supposed to be not dangerous. I actually don't have a problem with it. I think it depends on what your protocol in your institution, who's watching over you and what they're going to say. I think that's what it comes down to. It's complaint dependent. I mean, Is that right? Yeah, it's got to touch hand. They might, might send them to me and say, hey, you know, do your same last thing. Uh, I'll wave my hands and say, we're fine. But <laughs> usually it's, it goes with this. So in theory, the one out of two million whatever that's put into uh, cardiac arrhythmia. Are those gonna be shockable rhythms that your basic AEDs are gonna be able to correct? So it's actually good you brought that up. I usually say that, I forgot to say it this time. When you're put into an arrhythmia from a taser, it's much easier to shock them out when you're in an arrhythmia from a heart attack or hypoxia or something else. So it's way, way, way easier. Your heart is more susceptible to shock and AED conversion when you're tased than for other reasons. And if you think about it, think about what happened. You have a normal body, and you had an R on T, and you were put into an arrhythmia because of being electrocuted for five seconds. The source is gone. It's not doing it anymore. If you are hypercalcemic, hyperkalemic, or if you have an MI going on, and I, you go into V-fib, V-tac, and I shock you, that milieu is still there. Your body is still the same, and it's still bad body, and it hasn't changed. So you have a much higher chance of not being shocked out or going right back into the bad arrhythmia even when you shock them out. So being in arrhythmia from a taser is actually safer than being in arrhythmia from other causes. Yeah, the one question I have though is, so patrol cars themselves usually have like the basic zone Deities. push go. Yeah, they, is this a rhythm that that particular unit will pick up? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay. All the zoles, all, all the AEDs, will pick up VTAC, VFIP. And that's the rhythm that you try to get them out of. Once you're flatline, that rhythm is super stable. It's never changing. We can't get them back out of it. But VTAC, VFIP is a shockable rhythm that you can get them out of. Anything else? All right, thank you guys for listening. I appreciate it. Thank you.